Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope uh, you're all hearing me loud and clear as I come across the airwaves to you from uh, from Hillsville tonight. Great to see you he all here tonight uh, for our webinar. Uh, we have uh, 99 registrations. Um, we missed the ton. We missed the 100 by one person. Uh, so we usually get 50% uh, to 75% of those people who register attending the event tonight. So I'm expecting somewhere between 50 and 70, 80 people to attend uh, overall. And it's great to see you all here um, for this event being uh, run uh, by the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub for our, uh, for our region um, and uh, also uh, by, uh, with, uh, with Hillsville Core. Uh, and the other constituent uh, community energy groups. Um, uh, we've got uh, Yarra Glen Energy, uh, a community energy group in Yarra Glen. Uh, we've got uh, Clean Energy Nilambic uh, over in the, the Nilambic uh, Shire. Um, uh, Bragg, the Bunyip Renewable um, uh, group down in, uh, in Bunyip. Uh, Eastern Climate Action over at Box Hill and um, a group up in the Dandenongs as well, Dandenong Renewable uh, Energy Association. Um, so we've got um, six community energy groups that are behind the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub, and um, they're all actively involved uh, in promoting the events that we are running. And it's great to have them and you here tonight uh, for this uh, seminar or webinar, Transform the Energy Efficiency of Your Home for All Year Comfort. Uh, with our home energy advisor Lucinda Flynn and of course it's the launch of our reverse cycle air conditioning community bulk buy uh, with Aaron Maloney now uh, from the company that we're working with Air Fusion out of uh, Eltham. But before we go any further tonight uh, I would like to acknowledge um, that uh, we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land and I'd also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who are present here tonight. We get a wide range of people attending these events. Some people have attended just about everything that we have ever run, and some people are brand new. So I like to start off with assuming that um, uh, most people are brand new, and I'll tell you a little bit uh, about uh, community renewable energy, uh, about Hillsville Core, and about the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub. If you want more information, you need to go to uh, the websites of Hillsville Community Renewable Energy Group, Hillsville Core, and the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub. Um, I'll only give you a, be a brief thumbnail sketch tonight. Um, but community renewable energy is all about communities taking charge of um, their uh, energy production, storage, uh, distribution, uh, and in some instances, um, uh, also the sale of, of the energy in their local communities as well. This is uh, an international movement um, that uh, uh, has roots in um, Europe, um, including uh, Denmark and Sweden and Germany, the United Kingdom. And it's been in Australia now for well over 10 years, 15 years. Um, there's well over 100 community energy groups all around Australia. And uh, these groups consist of volunteers from local communities, um, not-for-profit groups who want to provide some leadership for their communities around um, renewable energy and transitioning to renewable energy away from carbon intensive uh, energy production uh, so that we can um, try to do something about the problems with climate, uh, with, with, with the climate emergency that we are in at the moment. Um, here's the core, here's the Community Renewable Energy uh, Incorporated, uh, was started by me, uh, Jeff Barlow, uh, back in 2017. And um, at the time I was semi-retired and uh, was really frustrated, angry and annoyed about the lack of action on uh, renewable energy and uh, climate change at a national level. And uh, I thought, well, the best way to uh, utilize that frustration, that anger and annoyance was to try to do something positive. So I set up uh, the Hillsville Core 
um, uh, with a, a group of very passionate volunteers in Hillsville uh, to provide leadership in our community to transition to uh, solar panels and batteries, uh, heat pumps, reverse cycle air conditioners, uh, and hopefully also some solar farms with batteries and uh, neighborhood batteries uh, as well. And currently we're also looking at uh, solar car parks and EV chargers. So if you're interested in this sort of field uh, and you're interested in being involved in community energy group, um, get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with you, the closest community energy group uh, to you, where you could also become a volunteer if you wanted to uh, and get involved in this uh, uh, this project, which is uh, happening all around Australia at the moment. The Yarra Valley Community Power Hub um, is actually auspiced uh, by Hillsville Corps and came about as a consequence of Hillsville Corps applying for a grant to Sustainability Victoria um, for money that was made available by the Victorian government to set up seven community power hubs uh, right around Victoria, five in the regions and two in the Melbourne metropolitan area. Um, the community power hubs uh, uh, each received uh, $428,500. Um, we have a contract for one year. And we will hear on the 3rd of May this year whether those contracts will be extended or not, because that is the date that the uh, state budget um, will be announced. Um, the hubs essentially are focused around providing support for the various community energy groups, the voluntary community energy groups. Um, we have paid staff, and our job is to uh, take the load off the, the volunteers in the community energy groups to help them with marketing, help them with um, communication systems, uh, help build up their administrative uh, systems and, uh, uh, and help to provide them with some of the funding that they need to reach out into their local communities to help to transition their communities into renewable energy. So we're very grateful to Sustainability Victoria and uh, the Victorian government for this funding. It's been a tremendous boost and we are hoping of course that the funding will continue into the future uh, but we won't know until the 3rd of uh, May whether that is the case or not. But in any case, if the funding doesn't continue, we've been able to do a tremendous amount of work so far this year. And some of that work you'll hear about uh, from uh, both myself and uh, Lucinda and Aaron Maloney, who will be speaking um, tonight. Um, the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub also has um, uh, support from... Uh, the six community energy groups in our region, they are constituent members of the hub. They form a steering group, which runs the hub. Uh, and so they all have a say in the way that uh, the, the hub functions and the activities that we get involved in. Um, I think that that's probably enough to say uh, about the hub. Apart from the fact that uh, we are sponsoring quite a number of, or we are running quite a number of uh, community offers, uh, bulk buys, and a range of different renewable energy products. And uh, those you'll hear more about tonight uh, from Lucinda, from Aaron, and myself. Um, I think that's about enough from me now. Uh, I will be saying more later uh, in the meeting. But uh, for now, what I would like to do is to uh, introduce you to Lucinda Flynn, who's our keynote speaker for tonight. Um, Lucinda's uh, speaking primarily on uh, the, the major topic, transforming the energy efficiency of our homes so that we can create all year comfort. Um, and um, uh, I've been working with Lucinda now for probably about six months or so. Lucinda is also um, a, the, the teacher of uh, a course that we're running through Box Hill Institute. That's a course that the hub um, uh, has uh, established um, to train volunteers to bring home energy efficiency services to their local communities. It's not a, a formal, uh, well, it's not an, an official certificated course, um, but it's a three-day course that uh, does provide quite a, little, a lot of background information um, including a practical, so you get theory and practical uh, training um, to help your community members 
uh, develop more efficient um, energy uh, systems in, in the home. And Lucinda is our teacher in that program, as well as being our keynote speaker tonight. Um, Lucinda is passionate about sustainability in every aspect of her life, as well as co-founding her company, Going Green Solutions, and building a business with Sean to what it is today. Now, Sean is her partner. She has a certificate for in residential energy efficiency assessing. She's an accredited assessor for the Victorian Residential Efficiency Scorecard, and she has a permaculture design certificate. Uh, Lucinda presents on a range of sustainability, green purchasing and energy efficiency topics around Melbourne and loves spreading knowledge about energy efficiency, permaculture and self-sufficiency. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, Lucinda here tonight. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to Lucinda, who will provide uh, the rest of the presentation for you for the next 45 to 50 minutes. Over to you, Lucinda. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's absolutely wonderful that there's been so many people signing up to this uh, webinar tonight. And Jeff's right. I, I, um, I absolutely love my job. Um, I, I work as a scorecard assessor. And what that means is that I go into people's homes all around Melbourne and actually all around Victoria and help them work out how they can make their homes more energy efficient. So um, it's been fantastic teaching the short course um, in conjunction with the hub. Um, the hub's organised all of that and um, I've really enjoyed working with the students and I'm excited that they can then go back into their local communities and spread that information further. Tonight's um, presentation from me is my aim is that it will whet your appetite and hopefully make you inspired to do some things in your own homes. But if, if it does even more than that and you want to learn more, then perhaps you could consider joining the next uh, training course that we're gonna be do, doing for volunteer advisors. So more about that later, but here I go. I will share my screen and we'll begin. Okay. What is an energy efficient house? So I, I tend to like to begin with what, what it isn't because I think there can be a bit of um, um, confusion about it meaning that you have to be extremely frugal and not use your heating and wear your ski jacket inside instead of turning the heater on. And I very much don't agree with that. To me, having an energy efficient house is actually about being way more comfortable but just spending a lot less on heating and cooling to to be comfortable. So it's a house that is often comfortable um, without any heating or cooling because it just keeps, it keeps its temperature. If you do need to resort to active heating and cooling, it's easier to heat up and it maintains its temperature for longer and it should cost less to run. Why would we want an energy efficient home? Well, um, there are lots of reasons and the ones that are probably the most common are cost, Everyone's different though. Each person might take, have, uh, they might come up across, approach, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> they might approach their energy efficiency from a different motivation. Some people, it's all about cost and the other things don't matter. And this is a very significant motiv motivation because the average home in Victoria costs about $18 hundred dollars a year just to run the main fixed appliances which is going to be in large part heating um, so anything that you can do to improve your energy efficiency is going to hopefully reduce those costs so why wouldn't you do it the second one is comfort um, like I said um, an energy efficient home is generally just going to be more comfortable and nicer to live in and the other one is, of course, environmental. And Jeff touched on that when he mentioned the climate emergency. Anything that we can do to reduce our reliance on um, fossil fuels or any type of energy, really, the more resilient we can make our homes without having to resort to um, powering them, the better for the environment. Victorian homes are actually all Australian homes, but Victorian homes definitely are typically inefficient. There are a few reasons for that. I think one of them is just that we live in a comparatively mild climate. Although it does get cold, it's not freezing and you can sort of manage if you have to. We also haven't had any building requirements. Well, we have had building requirements, but not to any degree that 
makes um, homes be built in an energy efficient way until yeah. more recently. Even now, the six star rating for a new home is not very high. Um, we've had lots of cheap fuel that we, so we've, it's just been easy to turn on heaters and coolers and use gas and electricity without really thinking too much about it. The other thing is, um, and, and I think feeds off all of those things is that we just don't really have a very good understanding of how our homes work. And um, that's due to the cheap fuel, the poor design, that sort of thing. We just haven't ever really been forced to look at it. And this is something that I would love to see change. I think there is so much capacity for reducing energy use and reducing our impact on climate uh, change through our homes. The three main factors of energy efficiency uh, the building shelf thermal efficiency. So that's about how well your, um, your building, the building construction, keeps heat in in winter and keeps it out in summer. Then you've got appliance efficiency, and that's about how, how well your devices are giving you the effect that you want for the fuel that you put in. And to try and give an example of that, if you have an open fireplace, it's about 5% efficient. And what that means is that you burn fuel and 95% of the heat that you want goes up the chimney, 5% comes out to you as heat. So 5% efficient. Whereas a, an efficient reverse cycle air conditioner, such as what Aaron will be talking with us about later, it could be 300, 400, 500% efficient, which means that for each unit of electricity it uses, it's going to give us three, four or five times the amount of heat. And then user behavior is, it feeds back into each of those things. So you could have a really efficient thermal um, envelope of your building and efficient appliances, but you could be using them in a really inefficient way. And my, my favorite example of that, because I have teenagers is, your teenagers are throwing a party and they have the heaters on full bore and all the doors and windows open. So of course, that's not gonna be an efficient house. Um, typically, heating is the largest use of energy in a Victorian home, and that's the that's my main purpose of showing this graph, which is from the Sustainability Victoria website. Um, and that's why if I'm going to a house to talk to people about energy efficiency, a lot of my suggestions are going to be focused on how to reduce the need for heating or make the home better at, at um, holding the heat that we do generate from appliances. Um, so just, just to keep that in mind, as I go through a lot of these things will be about that. I'll start with building shelf thermal efficiency. Um, I'm sorry that I'm gonna have to skip through things quite fast. There's so much in um, home energy efficiency and that's the reason I like it, I suppose. It's just such an interesting topic and every one of us lives in a home. So there's pretty much never gonna be a case where you won't be able to learn something. Anyway, I will... Um, briefly introduce each of the three areas. And um, okay, building shell thermal efficiency. The, the, um, the numbered um, bullet points here are the, the main areas that I would always look at in a home. And they're also listed in order of importance. Generally, I would always be thinking of zoning of a house first, then draft proofing, then ceiling insulation, then windows and then the wall and underfloor insulation last. Of course, it depends on the home. Every home is individual, but this is generally the rule of thumb. For zoning, the reason it's so important is that heating and cooling by zone is always going to be more efficient than trying to heat a larger area. And that's just purely because it's you're using energy to heat and cool a smaller volume of air. Um, another thing about zoning is that it can be not just about restricting the area you're heating and cooling, but it could be about zoning out areas that are having a ne negative impact on your heating and cooling. For example, if you live in an older house and you have one of those permanently open louver windows or something like that, which are typical in a sort of 60s, 70s house, if you've just got that open to the rest of the house and you're heating, all that heat's gonna be constantly left uh, lost out of that window. So zoning is about um, zoning areas in, also zoning areas out. Some of the ways, so an older house, 
uh, is usually well zoned because it was just good design and people generally weren't heating their whole houses. And one of the challenges of a new house is often that it's open plan and it's also often um, ducted heating to the whole house, which just means that it's always going to be more expensive. Anything you can do to create smaller zones and allow yourself to heat and cool that way will reduce your costs. Some of the things that you can do are really simple, such as the picture on the left-hand side, which is, is just a curtain across a doorway. And the um, curtain rod that you see there at the top, you can get telescopic rods from the hardware store just for, I don't know, $20, $30, that you just open them up to fit and you can hang your curtain there, say, in winter, and then you can take it away again. So it doesn't have to be a permanent solution. And it can be something very thin like the Japanese curtain. It could be honeycomb blinds, such as the middle picture. That one's over a window, but you could use a honeycomb blind um, to, to close off a hallway or something like that. And then on the right-hand side, we have some examples of, of um, creating a zone between upper and lower stories of a home, which is very useful. It, it, it's a very common problem that double story homes are in winter, all the heat moves up, and often the living spaces are downstairs. So if you can zone that top area off and keep your heat downstairs, it's going to be to your benefit. Um, draft proofing is often cheap, uh, often simple to do, and it can make an absolutely massive difference to your uh, comfort. And I think that if you live in an older house, sometimes if the only thing you do is looking at zoning and draft proofing, you might make your home a lot more comfortable and cheaper to run. Uh, now, I want to mention the difference between ventilation and drafts. The difference is that um, we do need ventilation, definitely. We need to be able to choose to ventilate our homes and let fresh air in. But a draft is ventilation that is uncontrolled. And that's when we're talking about draft proofing, we want to make sure that there are no uncontrolled drafts. Controlled drafts, which is ventilation, is fine. This image shows a whole lot of common areas that there are um, drafts in a house, especially an older house, of course. And there are a few different ways that you can get help with draft proofing. One is through the Victorian Energy Upgrade Scheme, uh, which I'll touch on briefly at the end of this presentation. You can get draft proofing equipment at the local hardware store, and there's also some other specialist draft proofing equipment stores. This image shows um, it's also from Sustainability Victoria, but it shows the comparative impact of different kinds of drafts on um, your, your comfort and your, your, your heat transfer from your home. You'll see there that the biggest one is actually a chimney, an open chimney. A lot of people don't realise that. They might leave a chimney, op an open fireplace for beauty and to use it every now and then, but it's actually a massive hole that's sucking, actively sucking all your nice warm air out of the house. Then we've got other things that people might not have thought of, such as evaporative cool events, wall vents, um, louver windows, and then things like external doors, fans um, that you may have heard of before. And we'll go through these very briefly. So open chimneys, they're the simplest. If you're never gonna be using it, I would just plug it up. You can get a fancy device called a chimney sheep that is the top right-hand side two corners. Really, it's just a, thick piece of felt that has an attachment that allows you to block up the chimney and then pull out that chimney sheet if you want to be able to light a fire. There's also one, the bottom right hand corner picture is a chimney stop from a local Melbourne business called EcoMaster. And you could also just use high density polyester to stuff into the chimney place. There are a bunch of things that you can seal with weather strips. You can get weather sealing strips from a hardware store. They don't always work depending on the purpose because of various reasons about, you know, you might have tried to put weatherproofing on a door and then the door won't close because the foam is too thick, things like that. This is the sort of area where it can be useful to talk to somebody more specifically about your home and can look and give you some advice that's more pertinent to your situation. But in general, um, weather stripping can be applied to external doors, uh, windows and also internal doors to drafty areas such as that, you know, bathroom with a louver window. Drafts that you can seal with cork are particularly um, fun, and by cork I mean a corking gun. There's actually nothing as satisfy, 
satisfying as walking around your house and just filling up all the gaps and cracks that you see everywhere with cork, and it will reduce the amount of air um, that's coming in and out of your house. I forgot to mention that they say that the average Victorian home, if you added up all the gaps and cracks in your home, it would be the equivalent of a one metre square window open all day and all night um, in your home. So that's how significant it can be if you can imagine having that window open all the time. So for caulking, you it would be for things like wall vents, the top left-hand picture. These are very common until 1990-ish. Um, then there's skirting board gaps, just gaps in plaster, anywhere where walls, floor, ceiling are joining, and things like um, when, when plumbing has been done or um, electrical work where there's been a hole cut in the wall or the floor, often those are not sealed. So they're easy ones that you can um, seal up. Unsealed exhaust fans, a lot of people don't realise that they are very common and they're a big draft, but they're also very easy to fix. By that, I'm talking about the um, image on the bottom right-hand side. That shows an unsealed exhaust fan from in the roof space. You can see that it's just a hole in the plaster and there's a free airflow between the house and inside your ceiling space. It's very easy to fix by adding a draft stopper and that's what that black object is. It's also free under the Victorian Energy Upgrade Scheme that, um, and we can help you. The hub has set up a partnership with HomeLab who does VEU installations. So you can organize something like that for your home. It's free for an unlimited number of draft stoppers, basically as many as, many as you have unsealed exhaust fans. Now, the one, um, the one situation where you can't seal a fan is the picture in the middle, which is a tastic, it looks like it's on a wall, it's actually just positioned wrong, it's, it's on a roof and it's a heat lamp, such as you'd have in a bathroom. Those ones you can't seal because they run too hot. In that situation, we would just recommend you draft seal the door to the bathroom and that way it can be drafty and the rest of your house doesn't have to suffer. Uh, here's some examples of open skylights. The top right hand picture is a skylight. Often skylights don't have anything at the ceiling level. This is actually from our house, the original skylight, and it just had a sort of a mesh plastic thing, but it was completely open. I'm not really sure what purpose it fit, fitted. Um, also, <laughs> that louver window is also a, the original window from our house. Um, constant airflow. And then there's another example there of a permanent vent in a window. The picture at the bottom right hand side is of a product called Sun Tough, which is pretty much just, it's um, clear plastic, but it's it's got cellular, um, it, it's a cellular um, mate, a design, which means that if you cut it to size and put it in, you get a bit of a double glazing effect. And that would be an excellent thing to put in the, at the ceiling level of a skylight or um, over a louver window. Evaporative cool events are actually quite drafty. A lot of people don't realise that. The reason is that as opposed to a ducted system of heating or cooling, which is a closed system, an evaporative cooler system is open, which just means that there's constant airflow through the, the um, unit on the roof and through those um, the vents into the house. Again, a simple fix is to add um, evaporative cool event covers. You can also do it very cheaply by cutting um, uh, contact, clear contact. There's an excellent YouTube video showing somebody doing that. I've also seen people have cut squares of plywood and just slipped it inside the cover for the, um, for the winter. Basically, you close them up during winter and then open them up during summer. Recessed downlights are another draft. You can seal them by adding a downlight cover and, or of course you could replace them with a sealed unit. Um, and the, the other, the, the top right hand side picture is another draft that there's quite big gaps around that globe into the ceiling space. Depending on how big it is, you may be able to cover it with some sort of downlight cover or it might be better to replace that one. But just a very quick note about, um, uh, the safe, safety with draft proofing and also um, um, having any sort of open wood fire or a gas space heater. Basically, if, if you have a, either of those kinds of 
appliances in your house. We wouldn't recommend draft sealing too thoroughly because it just might mean that you've got combustion products in the air. I would always recommend if you have a gas space heater to install a carbon monoxide monitor and just have it, have it regularly cleaned and serviced to make sure it's working well. Ceiling insulation. Um, this image shows, it, it's one of those unusual things where uh, just a small amount of gaps has a very big impact on how well your ceiling insulation is functioning. In, it's actually, if you have 5% gaps in the coverage of your ceiling insulation, it halves the value of how, how well it's working. The current minimum is around R4.4 for ceilings. And um, one of the things that can happen, actually, I, I think I may have a picture of it here. Yeah. Um, you see how the, the top middle picture, you've got what is pretty much looks like pretty new insulation. It's not too bad. It's not very thick, but it's also not too bad. But um, trades have come in and installed a light and an exhaust fan, and they've moved all the insulation away and not put it back. This happens all the time with trades going into roof spaces. The picture on the right hand side shows the exact same thing. So even if you started off with reasonable insulation, it's quite possible that if you've had people working in there, it might not be good anymore. So you really need to check that it is nice and thick and that it gets full coverage, which the picture at the top left-hand side um, shows really good coverage where it's actually double layer. It goes right over the um, ceiling joists. You can do um, ceiling insulation yourself, but of course there are hazards. It's actually, it's really a horrible job. So, um, you know, do it, if you're feeling um, very handy and you, uh, look up safe ways to do it, make sure you've read all of the guides about how to keep yourself safe, then sure you can give it a shot. Things like dust in your eyes, in your nose, inhaling it, electrical safety, possible asbestos, and of course falling off a ladder or even falling through the ceiling. Uh, window improvements. This is one of my favourite areas to talk to people about because um, double glazed windows have been so heavily marketed that often people feel that that is the only option they have. And for a lot of people, it's just not financially viable. So what I love to be able to explain to people is that they actually have many, many opportunities to improve the thermal efficiency of their windows. And they range from anything from very cheap to the most expensive and everything in between. These are the things that impact the thermal efficiency of windows. And by that, I mean the ability of windows to slow down the transfer of heat through them. There are window coverings and pelmets. So even if you have single glazed uh, windows, if you have really good window coverings and pelmets, that can make a big difference. Then of course, there are glazing upgrades that everyone's heard of. The frame choice also makes a difference. And external shading is absolutely critical if the, the problem is uh, summer heat gain. Now this uh, image is a very interesting look at the different impact of window coverings and pelmets. If you look first at those uh, arrows, so the bottom arrows, um, actually, no, first look at the stars, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting you all messed up. So the, the orange star or the red star, it shows a single glazed window with something like a curtain, not particularly thick curtain or a Holland blind and no pelmet. And then the same exact situation, but adding a pelmet brings it to the blue star. So you can see that it actually reduces the heat transfer through the window quite significantly just with a pelmet. The second example I wanted to show you is that um, the orange arrow shows a standard double glazed window with no window coverings at all. And then the blue arrow, shows a single glazed window, but with heavy line drapes and a box pelmet. So you can see from that, that a single glazed window with heavy line drapes and a pelmet and the drapes closed is actually better at slowing down heat transfer than upgrading to double glazing if you don't have a covering. The key with any window coverings is to reduce airflow across the glass. Um, heavy line drapes are a brilliant way of doing this with a pelmet. The top right hand picture shows another really good option, which is a honeycomb blind or a cellular blind 
that is installed inside the window reveal to basically block off airflow from that window. The two pictures at the bottom right hand side are of different kinds of pelmets because a lot of people will think a pelmet has to be the box pelmet, but it doesn't. It can be um, an invisible pelmet and these are examples of a, a kit that you can buy and also just a, um, how you can cut out, I think it's weed mat and make them that way. Um, glazing upgrade options, low cost to high cost, like I said, and they can be any combination of new DIY and secondhand. Um, you can have double glazing, secondary glazing, or even, even temporary options for upgrading your um, windows. And I'm gonna go through them all with some pictures. Double glazing, everyone knows what that is. The most expensive option is to take out your whole window and frame and put in a new double glazed window and a new frame. You can also get um, secondhand new units fairly easily. There's a lot of instances where they're over ordered for building jobs and then the builders just want to move them on. So you could, might be able to get something that fits your space secondhand at a much, much lower cost. And an option, a really good option for people who have existing good quality timber frames is just to replace the glass with double glazing and leave the frames um, as they are. It's a lot cheaper and timber frames are very thermally efficient, so it's well worth keeping them. When I talk about secondary glazing, I mean where the window is left as it is and a second pane is brought and attached to the window. And this picture shows a professional secondary glazing job. You can see it looks really good. The companies listed in that dot list are different companies around Melbourne that do this. Some of them will only work with timber framed windows. Others will work with aluminium framed or steel windows. So you just got to choose the one that suits you. Secondary glazing can also be done DIY. And um, the most common way to do this is to affix a panel of clear acrylic to your existing windows. And then, so the two pictures there, one is showing somebody screwing a panel on it. it the reason it has that stuff sticking to it is that's how it comes to stop it getting scratched. Don't worry, you peel that stuff off so you can actually see through it. People do actually ask if, if it looks the same or if it blocks the view, but it doesn't. It's completely clear. You wouldn't know it's not glass. And the benefit is that because it's not glass, it's not going to break like glass. Um, now, with, with that um, DIY secondary glazing, of course, you'd have to be a bit handy to do it, or maybe you've got a really good handy person like we did, so we got our local handy person to put it in for us. And there's more options too. Say if you're in a rental or if you just don't have a budget but you really need to do something with your windows, you can put bubble wrap on them, and yes, it's going to look a bit dodgy probably but if it's in an area that you're not actually looking at the window like a bedroom you just want to make that you just want to stop all the cold coming through the window bubble wrap can be a brilliant way and it's removable so good for a rental um, and another option is temporary film such as clear comfort that gets added uh, onto the picture on the right shows it's a bit like secondary glazing but it's a very thin film um, that gets added to create a still airspace. Frames do definitely matter, and these pictures show, so the blue arrows show a single glazed window. The, um, the one at the top of the graph has the most heat transfer. That's with the aluminium frame, but if you had a timber or UPVC frame instead, it would be a lot less heat transfer. Then if you move to double glazed windows, the aluminium framed one is the first red arrow. And then if you chose a timber or UPVC frame instead, it would be the very bottom one. And the other interesting thing is that um, a single glazed window with a timber or UPVC frame is not that far in difference be between a double glazed window with an aluminium frame. So if, if you are going to invest in new windows, really try and avoid aluminium frames. Unfortunately, with a lot of new builds, the builders don't even offer a choice. You get double glazed windows with aluminium frames. And even if you wanted to, you couldn't upgrade it. So that's a real shame, but hopefully that will change soon. Ballpark costs of window upgrades are pretty much new double glazed windows and frames, about $800 a meter square. Just the glass, if you put that into your existing timber frames, 
around 270 a metre square, but not installed. So you'd either um, have to install it yourself if you're handy or get someone else to do it. Professional secondary glazing is roughly 450 a square metre. DIY secondary glazing, maybe two to 300. In, including the installation for a double, you know, two metres square, excuse me. And clear comfort, that's the window, the um, temporary window film. You can get a big pack of it, enough to do five or 10 windows for, for not that much, no more than 200 and probably less. External shading, as I mentioned, is really key in summer. If you have heat um, touching your windows in summer, then it's like having a, a radiator on in that room and the best way to stop it is just with shade and ideally it'll be shade that are, that shades you in summer and allows sun through in winter so that you can benefit from that um, solar heat and an excellent option for that is the deciduous vine this picture shows my favorite one it's an ornamental grapevine and they're just so beautiful but of course you can use retractable canvas blinds and things like that Okay, we're on to wall and underfloor insulation. I told you I was gonna speed through everything. Um, as, as Jeff mentioned, if you would like more information afterwards, you can register for a free home energy advisory session with one of the volunteers that uh, we've been training up, or um, you could even maybe decide to become trained yourself and join our next course. Now, wall and underfloor insulation, I don't always recommend them. It totally depends on the house. And examples are, if you, um, well, I'll give my own example. We're in a 70s house. It's on a hill on stilts and the underfloor is very open, lots of airflow. And we only had floorboards between us and outside. So for us, underfloor insulation is, was actually a really high priority. Whereas if you live um, in a brick veneer house that has an enclosed subfloor and it's you know, the subfloor is quite narrow, not much airflow, and you have carpets throughout or floating floorboards, something like that, I probably wouldn't bother with underfloor insulation. So it all depends on your own situation. Um, actually, wall, wall insulation, I would pretty much always advise, but only once you've done all those other things first. Here are a few pictures. So they show the, the left-hand grouped ones, show wall insulation being pumped into a brick wall and into a weatherboard wall. They also show that if you have um, if you have tiles on your roof, sometimes they can blow in a bit from the top, but they generally have to uh, drill some holes as well. Of course, if you're renovating and pulling plaster internally off your walls or even weatherboards externally, then you can definitely put in wall insulation, the standard, you know, um, bats, and that will be a really good option. But this is more for when that's not being planned and this is quite a cost-effective way to do it without having to renovate your whole house. With underfloor insulation, the most important thing is to choose a product that is made for underfloors. It's gonna be a lot more uh, rigid than, so you wouldn't just use ceiling bats underfloor because they're going to sag. And these are two different ways to install it. You can either staple it in um, to the timber, beams or you can strap it in. All right, appliances. The main ones, at, well, you may remember that chart before. The biggest use of our energy is usually heating. Usually then hot water is second, but again, it depends on the house. Then we've got cooling and all of our other plug-in appliances. And there's a couple of things that I haven't listed here. One is lighting, which used to be potentially a, a really significant cost when we had incandescent lights or even halogen recessed down lights. Neither of them are really very common anymore and you can't even buy them. So um, generally lighting is no longer a big energy issue in our homes. One that is though, is if you have a pool or a spa, they just use a lot of energy. It's, it's how they are. There are certainly things you can do to reduce how much energy they use, but they will always be a drain on your energy. Um, okay, let's have a look at these appliances. But all of these charts that are coming up are from Sustainability Victoria. They have some fantastic comparison charts on the cost per year of running different kinds of appliances. This one is about heating. And you can see that if you're looking at cost to run heating in a small 
room, 30 metres squared. The cheapest option is going to be a five-star air conditioner. And in a medium house, it's going to be a, well, this says a 3.5-star ducted reverse cycle air conditioner. Actually, it would probably be a lot cheaper to run individual air conditioners in different areas. Um, but in any case, heating, the most, the cheapest option for heating is going to be reverse cycle air conditioners. I can't tell you how many houses I go to where they, they say, you know, I, I, I've thought about air conditioning, but I know it just uses so much energy and I, I can't, you know, justify it. And, and they're probably pretty happy when they find out that their, the technology has improved so much that reverse cycle air conditioning is a very energy efficient way to heat these days. Anything you do to improve your building shell, the part that we've just talked about, will also reduce your heating costs because it reduces the amount of heat that you're losing through your building shell and, and having to replace by from your heater. And there are some really good rebates. Um, for split systems at the moment. Again, Aaron will tell us about that and he, his company can apply for those rebates for you. So um, go and investigate replacing things with uh, split systems. Other ways to make your heating more efficient are um, by setting the, the thermostat. The ideal for winter is setting it between 18 and 20 degrees. So the aim is not to um, make, it's not to be walking around in a t-shirt thinking it's summer, it's just to be dressed in winter clothes, but not be freezing and be quite comfortable. Also heating by zone, which we talked about already, um, making sure appliances are serviced and cleaned. Now that middle picture at the, um, the, the top middle is an example of duct work of an old, uh, I think it was probably a gas ducted heating system that just over time, ductwork um, does what this has done. It just fails, basically. The, the plastic deteriorates. You can get tears and breaches in it, and you end up heating under your house instead of in your house, which nobody wants to do. So having doing things like um, replacing your ductwork, fixing it, checking it um, will all help. The bottom middle picture is the, a picture of a dirty air conditioner filter. A lot of people don't realize they actually have filters. You just flip open the top of your air conditioner, take the filter out and give it a wash with warm soapy water and put it back in. And it can make a massive difference if it's been very dirty, you won't believe what a difference it makes. Oh, and that picture on the right hand side, I'm a huge fan of personal heating devices. It sounds really daggy and I'm sure lots of people think that only old older people have, you know, heated rugs and things, but you can get heated vests to go working outside. I've got, this is my heated seat pad pictured there. And it means that in my office, I can often just have that heated seat pad on and not put in a heater on at all in winter because it keeps my body warm and they cost just a tiny fraction to run, a bit like a electric blanket. They just don't cost much. So go for the personal heating devices. Also, they're great if one of the people in your house feels the cold a bit more than everyone else. That way you can keep the temperature to suit everyone and they just boost their warmth with a heated uh, personal heating device. Cooling. Ceiling fans are, of course, extremely uh, efficient to run. Evaporative coolers are technically very energy efficient, but personally, I think that the Melbourne weather has changed enough that it's making them not so um, useful partly because we're becoming more uh, humid and we're getting, you wouldn't know it the last couple of years, but we are getting more extremes in heat. So again, the next best option would be a reverse cycle air conditioner, otherwise known as a split system. And again, build anything you do to improve your building, shading your windows, things like that is gonna make your cooling more efficient. Uh, to improve the efficiency of your cooling, make use of ventilation to vent out hot air after a um, warm day using ceiling and pedestal fans before you put on coolers and even while you put on coolers. Setting the thermostat again to a, you know, it's still going to be fairly warm, but you just wear cool clothes. Cooling by zone and again, servicing and cleaning your appliances. Hot water systems. The most common type of hot water system that I see is a gas storage system. There are really good rebates to upgrade from your electric hot water system or your 
old slash inefficient uh, gas storage system. Technically, the most energy efficient option will be a solar hot water system with an instant gas boost. But many of you listening tonight might be interested in moving away from gas. I know that that's my goal um, eventually. Um, and in that case, a heat pump is an absolutely brilliant option. It's the hot water equivalent of a reverse cycle air conditioner. It uses the same technology and it uses a fraction of the energy of the old style electric hot water systems. The other excellent thing about a heat pump is that you can time them to boost during peak generation times with your solar. And that means that you, you know, you're getting, they're pulling the heat out of the air and then boosting with the solar, which gives you very, very cheap hot water. Um, other ways to help improve the efficiency of your hot water is making sure your shower heads are reasonably water and energy efficient. Three star wells rated is good. Again, you can have your showers upgraded free to three star wells rated ones under the BEU scheme if they're more than nine litres a minute. Another good option is lagging or insulating the hot water pipes. This picture shows a really good example of lagging. Um, and that just keeps the hot water in the pipes while it's traveling from the system to wherever it's coming out. And there's also a thing called a valve cozy that goes on the um, um, outlet, the, the, uh, the pressure outlet pipe. And that again, just keeps your warm warmth in. You can make sure your hot water, uh, sorry, your washing machine is connected to your hot water system rather than generating its own hot water. Well, better even is to wash in cold water. If you do happen to need hot water, make sure it's connected into the hot water system, which is gonna be a more efficient way to generate hot water than if the machine makes it itself, which it'll be doing like, a bit like a kettle. And if you have mixer taps, which a lot of us do, just try and get in the habit of always having them angled towards cold. Because that way, you know, when you put on a tap and you just put it on for a sec to wash your hands, it's not even time for the hot to come through. But if you have it on the warm or hot, it means that it's already drawn hot water out of your system, and that's just going to cool down in the pipes and get wasted. All right, all the other appliances, you would have seen star ratings on different appliances, and from 2012, all of the major appliances need to have them. The main thing to know about um, the energy star ratings is that they compare like for like. So using a fridge as an example, the first thing you need to do is work out what size fridge you need. Um, which you don't want to oversize it, you don't want to undersize it, you want to know what you need. Say if you need a 300 litre fridge, then you're going to look for the 300 litre fridge that has the highest star rating. If you see a 300 litre fridge that's three star and a 600 litre fridge that's three star, they're not going to have the same energy use because they're not the same thing. And this website here is a good way to look at the different annual running costs of different appliances. And I just advise you, whenever you go to upgrade something, check it out and see if you can get um, a nice high star rating, which will reduce your running costs. Solar electricity is um, it's becoming very common. It, the prices have dropped so much that it has a typically very fast payback period of between three and five years. Of course, it depends on the house. And whereas older systems were sometimes only you know, you could only put them on north facing um, roof spaces. These days you could put some on north, some on east, some on west, and they all can be joined up to give you, and even if there's a bit of shade, they can cope with that these days. Um, there are good uh, rebates for that. My, my absolute key advice for anyone wanting to get solar electricity is to choose an approved supplier. Now, what, what, is, what, what is that? <laughs> so, any solar retailer has to be, well, they should be accredited by the Clean Energy Council. That's the peak body that accredits solar retailers. But there's about 3,000 accredited. And to my mind, it's a little bit like getting a license as a plumber. So it means you've got a license, but it doesn't mean you're ethical. It doesn't mean that you're any good. Well, it should mean you're good, but it doesn't necessarily. What's happened is that um, because there were so many issues with dodgy solar installers because of the rebate, um, the Clean Energy Council was um, encouraged 
strongly to put another level of sort of certification in. So they've added the approved supplier scheme. It's voluntary. Uh, retailers don't have to apply, but if they do, they have to um, prove that they've never been taken to court or VCAT for their work, that they have their warranties covered if they should go out of business, that someone else is going to take on the warranty and honour it. Just a lot of things like that. So I would only personally ever use an approved supplier. I think there's about 100 approved suppliers. It just means that you're going to reduce your chances of issues hugely. Uh, the best way to use solar, if you have it, is by what's called load shifting, which means you use it um, at the times that you're generating energy. That's when you're going to get the best bang for buck sort of thing um, by using that energy as it's being generated. Uh, the same as with all other appliances, get, it, get them serviced every now and then, clean them. Sometimes you see solar panels that have a thick layer of sort of um, it's not moss, it's more, anyway, vegetation <laughs> growing on it, which clearly isn't going to be generating you much um, uh, energy. And things like trees. Trees grow. Make, just keep an eye on your solar panels and make sure that um, perhaps trimming trees a little bit might be advisable. So hopefully this has whetted your appetite a bit uh, um, to do some more things in your own home. We, you could register for a free energy advisory service through the hub. There are people that will be in the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub groups offering that service. Soon um, there will be people being trained in the Hume Community Power Hub. And who knows, there might be people being trained in other of the power hubs as well. So have, you know, hook into your local clean energy group and see what they're offering. If you, would, if you think this might be something you'd like to learn more of, you could enrol in our short course. I'm going to be the teacher. And it's a mixture of both uh, te te um, technical understanding of all the things that impact energy efficiency, but there's also quite a focus on, um, you know, how to relate to the people that you might be going to see. Because every house is different. Every person is different. They have their own motivations and values and the, their own things that might challenge them or um, stop them from doing things. So you've got to be able to read between the lines to try and advise people about things that are actually achievable for them and that, that they will feel like they want to do as well. Another option is to register for a professional assessment. Uh, there is a fee for that and that would generally be me that comes to do that. Now, before I go, I want to very briefly show you a little bit about that Victorian Energy Upgrade Scheme that I mentioned. Um, there are, so it basically means that free energy efficiency products can be installed in your home. The hub has partnered with Home Lab to do this, as well as the free options. There are also some additional low cost upgrades that they offer. And each time they do that, they pay a small commission to the local Clean, the closest community renewable energy group to, um, um, to who, wherever they've done it. So it's, you know, win-win for all of us. You will all have been approached about changing light globes. Home Lab does all of those things as well. Um, also downlights, um, halogen downlights, or changing those, those big open downlights that I mentioned before, they can swap them over. Some of them have a fee. Sometimes there's a fee if, the, if you want them to be dimmable still. So these are yeah things that they can help you work out. And then there's other things such as draft sealing external doors, um, putting the draft stoppers over exhaust fans, changing shower heads. They can also install the home energy monitors that you've probably also seen advertised. And they can add lagging and valve cozies to your hot water systems. So you can register for that on the hub website as well. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. Um, oh. Yes, I would just like to thank you first, uh, Lucinda, oh. uh, for your presentation. Very, very interesting once again. And uh, I hope it's been uh, also of interest for uh, our people, uh, the people tonight who have been listening. Um, for everybody's uh, interest, uh, we, um, we are recording this session tonight, as you can see, uh, and yes. it will be made available afterwards for... Uh, anybody uh, who is interested in having a look at it and everybody who is um, 
uh, registered for the session tonight uh, will be informed where they can access the recording that's usually available a week or two weeks after the event. For any of you uh, who'd like to uh, do that uh, training program, don't forget to get in touch with us. Um, and uh, keep in mind too that we've got uh, six community energy groups in our area. So if you're really keen to do some uh, voluntary work, um, they'd love to, uh, love to hear you. Um, we will, uh, over the coming weeks, be running um, a community energy roadshow uh, around, our, around five of our six community energy groups. Um, and uh, we will have uh, some very interesting information in your in, in the local areas, uh, up in the Dandenongs at Emerald, uh, down in Bunyip, uh, Box Hill, uh, in Yarra Glen and, and in Hillsville. Um, we will be running this roadshow with a, a keynote speaker uh, and uh, lots of interesting information about uh, your local community renewable energy group. Um, just on a personal note, um, uh, over the years, uh, I've had to educate myself, as you're educating yourself now, on community renewable energy and uh, on the efficiencies of uh, uh, energy systems for my home. Um, and I started off putting solar panels uh, on the rooftop uh, with solar hot water and uh, haven't looked back uh, as far as energy bills go. Uh, and about two years ago, um, I, I did have uh, insulation in the ceiling, which was working very effectively. But I got an infrared camera and went around my place and you know, I could see all these cold spots on the floor. Uh, I, I've got a um, uh, just a wooden floor, uh, polished wooden floor, and uh, all the, the heat was being lost uh, through that. So I got underfloor insulation, which didn't cost very much money at all. Uh, and that made a, a huge difference. I also took advantage of the um, home, the Victorian government's home energy upgrade scheme uh, back in January this year got uh, somewhere around $150 worth of products uh, provided free of charge and installed free of charge. Uh, so that was a, a fantastic service that the Victorian government is providing. And if you're interested in that, all you need to do is go onto our website, click on the download list, uh, find uh, the uh, energy upgrade uh, scheme, and you again can register. Uh, for a no obligation um, uh, uh, connection uh, with Home Lab, we'll get in touch with you and talk about the possibilities of coming around to help you out in that way. Aaron um, is, is from the company Air Fusion which we are using uh, as uh, a company for the, um, for, for the community offer, a very reputable company from Eltham, uh, and uh, get uh, tremendous uh, feedback um, from, the, from their customers. Uh, they have very high standards and excellent reviews. Uh, they've been working for the last, I think, uh, 18 months, two years with Clean Energy Nilambic in, in uh, running... Um, a reverse cycle air conditioner community offer for that uh, uh, particular um, uh, renewable energy group. Uh, and uh, they've had uh, fantastic feedback. Um, Aaron is one of the directors of the company. Um, air Fusion was founded in 2014 uh, after both of the directors had spent the previous decades in the corporate world as managers with multinational companies. Um, Aaron lives in research and uh, he enjoys spending his free time in sporting clubs. Uh, he's a major supporter of the Eltham Wildcats and thoroughly enjoys the town, the local down to earth life uh, that their communities offer. Um, Air Fusion came together with uh, Aaron and his partner Peter when they could see the shift away from natural gas and evaporative cooling systems uh, and the need to focus on utilizing energy efficiency products for heating and cooling, which is what they're doing. Um, their, showcase, their showroom uh, showcases leading brands that offer exceptional, they offer also exceptional customer service and backup. They have a choice of 30 brands, uh, but they find that the Daikin and the Mitsubishi uh, market leaders um, in front and back end components. And they're the two systems that they're offering for the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub and our six constituent community energy groups. Um, 
Air Fusion has a real family feel. The showroom is manned six days a week with a coordination of their fabulous locally residing installation team running smooth as clockwork. Aaron has spent 30 years within the, uh, the air conditioning uh, industries working through an apprenticeship locally in Nunawading, and he spent several years working in the UK as an air conditioning technician with major brands such as Dakin and Mitsubishi. And without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to uh, Aaron, uh, who will talk with you about the community uh, offer of reverse cycle air conditionings that uh, his company Air Fusion is offering. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'd just like to uh, thank everybody for attending tonight. Uh, and Lucinda, that's been a fantastic presentation. I've actually learned a hell of a lot from uh, just those uh, that brief sort of 30, 40 minute slide. So thank you for that. I'd like to just quickly just run through my slides. There we go. <clears throat> so, our business was started in 2014. My business partner, Peter Crone and myself came together through a very amateur football career that we both had. And we thought of uh, some ideas to, to keep within the heating, ventilation, air conditioning industry. Uh, and we saw an opportunity open up in Eltham with a very small showroom or, or nice size showroom for us, but um, just a boutique showroom in some ways offering energy efficient solutions to homes and keeping, or well not keeping, but getting people to think about options away from the gas network. So we came up with the business name of Air Fusion and we've come up with a beautiful showroom and we've got offerings of up to 30 brands available. To be honest, we probably choose about two to three of those brands that can give us the complete overall picture uh, that we require uh, for our, I guess, our, our area as well as uh, our, our um, uh, environment. So we, we do a lot of work within Melbourne, right through the Fitzroy Carlton, but right up to King Lake, uh, where we've got two different areas of uh, uh, heating and cooling requirements. So with 30 years of experience, both amongst Peter and myself, uh, we thought this option of being able to make homes more efficient, provide better comfort to people, as well as providing a uh, less money being taken out of their back pocket by having bills being so excessive. So our staff are local staff. Uh, they're fabulous, well-trained, factory trained by Dakin and Mitsubishi, uh, and actually do take pride in their work. Just going through a little bit of a brief uh, technical view, I guess, of how an air conditioning, air conditioning system or heat pump technology works. So what we're using is the outside air uh, as an air-to-air -air heat transfer, and we're using the refrigerant as its path to pass that heat from outside to inside. And then in reverse, we're using the reverse cycle part. So being able to use the gas and depending on the type of refrigerant that we're now using, and most systems are using what we call R32 as a gas, which has a very low ozone depleting factor. Uh, and so from using that gas, we can, we can get star ratings of anywhere between three and seven stars. And that's a system operating at its worst performance. So that's a system operating for one hour at 100% for that whole hour, that will give you around six to seven stars. The benefit of an inverter air conditioning system is that it can ramp anywhere between zero to 100%, which allows your star ratings to go anywhere between three, five, seven, right up to a maximum of 10 zones, if, uh, 10, 10 stars. So that allows the efficiency of the inverter to be able to ramp down and provide one or two kilowatts or ramp up and, and provide up to 10 kilowatts of heating or cooling requirements. So it's almost in general terms, it's like putting a foot on an accelerator, depending on the temperature that you have set for that room, will adjust, the unit will adjust accordingly and provide accurate, 
climate control to that home. What's on offer today and why? We've reached out to Dakin and Mitsubishi to be part of this program. Uh, we've also run this program for the last 12 to 24 months with Millenbeek providing 100% Dakin as a brand. And with this offering, we're offering a lower spec model, or I guess not probably a lower spec, but just a cheaper alternative option with the Mitsubishi heavy industry. So we're offering Dakin at the high end with their superior products. And we've we'll got the option with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, again, a superior product, but just at a slightly lower price point. So we're offering single unit reverse cycle air conditioners at two clear price points, Dakin Cora Series and the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries product as well. Now, we're not only offering just these split systems. If there are duct systems or multi-head systems or um, VRV systems, then we are, we are happy to assist in any way. And it's not purely just a changeover or, or simple back-to-back -back installations. If you have a set of plans or a new development or a new renovation taking place and you'd like some advice on what you can do to do the whole home solution with zoning, with individual temperature control to each zone, then that's something we can also offer. Some programs that are out there at the moment is one that uh, we're currently uh, the initial, one of the initial suppliers of this program is the Home Heating Cooling Upgrade Program. Now we will assist you here in providing the information and that's marked on our website as a link that you can hop on there and download the, uh, the application form. It's simply about eight different questions there, depending on your household income, depending on your requirements within the home. Are you looking at replacing some gas heating? Are you looking at replacing an old split system that's not efficient anymore? Or you just don't have a unit in that living area that you'd like to put something in and provide heating. So the government are offering uh, uh, to eligible homes up to $1,000 in a rebate, up to $200 in disconnection of a gas appliance, and also up to $500 in any switchboard upgrades that are required to get you up to compliancy. So the main objectives here are to lower your energy bills, save on your heating costs, and reduce your emissions. So let's just talk a little bit here about the Dakin Cora models and the Dakin XL series in the premium models. Now, they can offer models from two kilowatts, which would comfortably do most small size bedrooms, right through the 9.5 kilowatts, which are designed to do large living areas. Now, these model numbers I'm speaking about here are in kilowatts of cooling capacity. This is the output of what the unit will deliver, not the input of what it will consume. So let's not let, get that confused. That's something I can explain shortly in regards to the star ratings, coefficiency of performance. So we've chosen Dakin as our leading brand, and we have been a Dakin dealer, I guess, for nearly eight years now. Uh, we find the product uh, number one across, whether it's for a bedroom or a 10-story apartment block, um, it can offer... Uh, all the solutions for us, the indoor options, they come in white, they come in silver, they come in black. Um, the intelligent eye function we find very useful. Wi-Fi options, and we do have some models now that are coming out completely with Wi-Fi inclusive. Uh, weekly timers, they come with a matte white finish. And great news now, so the last two to three years, the day conducted indoor units are built in Sydney and they are built for the Aussie homes. So uh, we find that product, the after sales service, it doesn't let us down um, and spare parts uh, as well as also very handy for the longevity of the units. Now the in regards to the products and the models that are on offer, so we're offering the Cora series here from 2.5 through the 9.5. If there are models there that I have missed in between, then, then we will certainly offer those as well. 
and it's a matter of offering the right correct size unit for that right that correct size room so to fit the application the pricing there that you will see includes a supply and installation back to back with up to four meters of field piping now there are um, additional costs and variations on the slide coming up but as you can see from this slide the coefficiency of performance in that column down the middle gives you some idea of how efficient these actual products are. As an example, the Dakin Cora in 2.5 kilowatt will deliver 2.5 kilowatts of cooling, 3.2 kilowatts of heating, while, re while requiring from your grid no more than half a kilowatt of power. So that's how we get our star ratings there or coefficiency of performance. That, as a, as a rule of thumb, would be roughly around five to six stars as a star rating because the star rating also takes in an algorithm that includes the standby power. Now, the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries range offer from a two kilowatt through to a 9.5 kilowatt. Leading consumer reviews, they have great, fantastic reviews, choice recommended, Wi-Fi as optional as a standalone product that sits beside it. Weekly timer, but they came, they do come in a gloss white as opposed to a Dakin that come in a matte white. So there's two difference in between the so looks. Fantastic unit, very reliable and uh, very efficient in regards to their their whole product lineup. Also running on the R32 gas. Just over, overview here of the efficiencies there. So we, we spoke about the 2.5 in the Dakin and we're now comparing the 2.5 in the Mitsubishi. So a slight reduction there in its coefficiency of, of performance. So 4.92 means that every one kilowatt of power that unit is consuming, it's delivering 4.92 kilowatts of output times. So uh, still a very efficient not as efficient as Dakin, but not far off it. So slightly at a lower price point than Dakin's, uh, but as, as I say, they, they are both very good high-end Japanese brands. Some options that do change in regards to the installation is the, the variations in the, the field piping, the wall bracket, it's the double story, single story, uh, condensate pumps and the like. So we, we've got a rough detail of some additional extras. And when we do provide a quote, it's an obligation free quote. We do provide all everything that we see. There's no fixed cost. Every, sorry, everything is a fixed cost that we provide in our quote. There's no variations that are going to get you down the tail end that you're going to leave that bad taste in your mouth. So we will provide a fixed quote based on what we believe is required and, uh, and there'll be no, uh, no variations down the back end. So on offer with those two products, uh, there is a link and it's available through the Yarra Valley, Yarra Valley Community Power Hub. Uh, where you can uh, offer the expression of interest and we'll provide you, as I, as I mentioned before, an obligation-free quote. Uh, and if we can come out to your property, fantastic. Uh, if we can reduce our carbon footprint and do it electronically, we'll do our best as well. Um, but we can certainly uh, be able to provide you a solution to heat and cool your, your bedroom, your living room, or if it's required, the entire house. So thank you for your time, and I'll hand it back over to you, Jeff. If there's any questions on the on the chat, I'll I'll have a little look through now and um, see if I can solve any of those. Aaron, does the include the Dakin floor mounted units? Yeah, we have options uh, for the Dakin floor mounted units. So thanks for that question, Jared. Um, they are not available through the home heating and cooling upgrade program. But uh, if you're not eligible for that, then yeah, we can certainly sort something out for those Dagan floor consoles. They're a fantastic unit. And in particular in the Altham area, we install a, a great deal of those models um, being at low level in a lot of mud bricks. Um, oops, sorry. I'll hand it over to you, Jeff. If there's any other questions I've missed, please let me know. 
I think that was the only one uh, for for your presentation, Aaron. But if there are any others that come through, we'll certainly let you know after the event. Um, well, there is one from Anne, uh, and she says, uh, which are the six or seven star models? Yeah, so th good question, Anne. So if you can imagine the smallest of the models will deliver the most stars because they're not delivering the most output. So most Japanese brands in the two and a half or two kilowatt to 2.5 kilowatt, you will generally get six to seven stars as a model though. So mm -hmm. either the Daikin, uh, the Mitsubishi Heavy is about a uh, five and a half, I, I believe. I can, I'll reconfirm these later. And the Daikin's roughly around uh, a six to seven star now in the uh, in the XL Premium, uh, Alira X, sorry, in the Alira X models. Um, but yeah, generally in the smaller capacity for the bedroom, you will get the highest star rated unit purely because it's not delivering as much as the bigger units. Thanks very much, uh, Aaron. And I think uh, one of the uh, important things for people to realize is that uh, putting these systems in is uh, really not just a cost, it's also an investment. Uh, so it's very different from purchasing a car where from the moment you drive it out of the showroom, it decreases in value. With these units, the, you're actually saving energy on your energy bills, saving money on your bills. So for the life of the systems, uh, within a two or three year period, they pay themselves back. Uh, and then it's all uh, cream on the cake uh, after that, so to speak, uh, from the, uh, the savings uh, on your bills. Um, we do have another question uh, here, Aaron. Uh, so will one have to install multiple units to cover the whole home? Yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, any air conditioning system or, or reverse cycle system, they are designed to heat or cool the room that they're in. So yes, if it's a large living area, you'll need one, one unit in there. And if it's a bedroom, you'll need a unit in another bedroom. But you can get units that will push heat through to other rooms and it will migrate but it's, uh, to, to efficiently do individual zones. And that's something Lucinda went through, which was fantastic going through each, each home and, and, and working through your home as a zone. Each zone, the most efficient way to heat and cool those, the home is by, by doing it through zones. So yes, often you will need multiple units throughout the house. There are central systems, as Lucinda mentioned, the ducted system that can be either under floor or in the roof that can do the entire home with zones. So you could get away from it uh, that way if, you, if you're not interested in having things on units on walls around the property. Oh, I think you're on, uh, Jeff, you're on mute there. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, okay. Thanks for your, for your presentation. We won't take any more questions right now because we're close to the end. Um, but I would like to thank you very much for an interesting presentation. And uh, just remind people again to go onto our website, go onto the drop down list uh, for our community offerings and uh, just submit a, uh, an expression of interest. There's also a lot of information on the website about the, uh, the uh, air conditioning systems, uh, including uh, links that will provide you with uh, further information as well. Um, I think that uh, um, we're getting close to the end now. I'd just like to do a, a brief summary of what the offers are that uh, uh, the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub uh, has for our region uh, through our six community energy groups. Um, we've got a number of community bulk buys, the heat pump, uh, which has been mentioned for hot water, uh, the electric vehicle bulk buy through the clean, uh, the, um, uh, the good car company. Uh, we're looking uh, to run a solar and battery uh, offer very shortly with the RACV and of course the reverse cycle air conditioners. Next slide, Tom. The Reclaim heat pump, which we're offering, uh, is designed by an Australian company for Australian conditions, and it's suited to the uh, cold climate down here in Victoria. Uh, and in, um, uh, it, uh, it also has no backup heater element uh, required. Uh, there are some heat pumps that you get where uh, when the weather gets colder, uh, they, they stop 
working as a heat pump and then they just operate as an electric uh, heater uh, because they have an element in them. The Dakin, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Reclaim Energy Systems uh, don't have that. Uh, they use naturally occurring CO2 as the refrigerant. There's very strong warranties on them. And there's a smart controller that allows programming to individual needs. You can run them from your solar system. So you run them from 11 o'clock in the morning to two in the afternoon. Uh, they act like a battery then. Um, so instead of sending your electric uh, uh, power out to the, um, the grid and getting next to nothing uh, for what's being paid nowadays, uh, you're actually saving money by putting that energy into heating up your water. Um, next slide, Tom. There's an electric vehicle bulk buy that we're offering with a good car company. Um, the average battery range uh, of these cars is 480 Ks. Uh, they're much cheaper than uh, the internal combustion engines. They have lower running costs than internal combustion engines. They deliver full torque instantly when you accelerate and all vehicles are secondhand and imported from Japan and modified for Australian conditions. They're priced from $22,000 and all cars are guaranteed. Um, again, go onto our website and for uh, an expression of interest, you'll be transferred over to the Good Company, uh, the Good Car Company uh, website where you can um, uh, click onto their drop down list uh, and uh, submit your expression of interest. We're looking to attract about 300 people uh, to uh, an event that the Good Car Company will be running um, next month. And uh, we uh, will then have an opportunity for people to go to a central place where they can hear a presentation from the Good Car Company. Um, they will be able to have a look at the secondhand vehicles that uh, are on display and we'll be able to go for uh, a ride in those vehicles as well. The way the system works is that uh, you order a vehicle, uh, they will then purchase the vehicle for you uh, under an auction system in Japan, and uh, the cars are then imported into Australia and modified and made available uh, for the, for the uh, price that uh, you've agreed to purchase. Next slide, Tom. Um, so we have, we're looking uh, at uh, working with uh, uh, RACV Solar um, to develop a, a solar panel and battery offer. And we're hoping to be able to announce that in more detail uh, very, very soon. Um, so with solar panels and batteries, uh, you're going to be saving quite a significant amount on your energy bills uh, and you're using environmental uh, friendly uh, power to, uh, to generate the electricity for your home and will also reduce your uh, carbon footprint. Next slide, Tom. The reverse cycle air conditioning community offer, as uh, Aaron has just mentioned, I won't go into the detail there. Aaron has told you quite a bit of, uh, about that. And the other services, Tom, in the next slide, uh, we're looking at um, home energy upgrades, as Linda mentioned, the home energy efficiency advice, uh, either on a voluntary basis uh, or uh, with uh, volunteers from the community uh, or uh, for a professional to come and help you in your home to get some advice on how to make it more energy efficient. There's the home energy efficiency training through the Box Hill uh, Institute, uh, community renewable energy short courses. One has run in Eltham uh, over a um, uh, five to six week period. Another one will be running up in Emerald and another in Pakenham. Uh, and uh, these are courses that are designed for the general community to learn all about community energy and community energy groups. Uh, and there's also do-it-your-home energy efficiency kits. Um, the next slide, Tom. There's free home energy upgrades, which Lucinda mentioned, uh, provided by the Victoria government, free of charge for the products and free of charge for the installations. Again, available through our website. Uh, the home energy efficiency advice. Um, the next, next slide, Tom. Um, yeah, the home energy efficiency advice, as uh, has been mentioned. And again, we'll go on to the, the next slide. And the training, of course, at, at, uh, at Box Hill. Next slide, Tom. Okay, the community energy courses. So which, what I mentioned to you, these are available through community houses, neighborhood houses, and living and learning centers. 
And uh, as I said, the first trial is already being completed and others will be coming soon. Next slide, Tom. Uh, home energy efficiency kits are available uh, uh, through your local council. Uh, they're available free of charge, not for hire. That's uh, an error on that particular slide uh, where you can get a diagnostic thermal imaging camera, power mate power meter, uh, and uh, uh, an instruction book, the energy freedom home book, a thermometer, and other important bits of equipment to do an analysis of your own home. Um, there are three local councils. I think it's Yarra Rangers, uh, Maroondah, uh, and uh, one other white horse, I think it might be, um, and uh, they're available through the Eastern Regional Library system. So just go on to the Eastern Regional Library website uh, and you can uh, book in to, uh, to uh, borrow one of those kits. I think there are three or four available through the system. The next slide, Tom. So that brings us to the end of the session. Uh, it's been a little bit of rush at the end because we're running a little bit uh, out of time, uh, but I would like to thank you all very much for attending. I hope it's been an interesting session for you. Um, I would like to thank our, our six uh, community energy groups, Clean Energy Nilambic, uh, uh, Bunyip Renewable um, uh, Action Group, uh, Hillsville Core, uh, the Dandenong Rangers uh, Renewable Energy Group, Eastern Climate Action Melbourne and Yarra Glenergy, all of whom are constituent members of the hub. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank Sustainability Victoria for the funding that has enabled uh, the hub throughout Victoria to be able to provide this great service to our local communities uh, and uh, to, to be able to make this webinar available uh, to you tonight. Uh, in addition, I would like to thank our, our councils uh, in, in, the, in the region uh, they've been very supportive of us, the Yarra Rangers Council, Cardinia Council, uh, Maroonda, uh, Whitehorse, and of course, Nilambic uh, Council as well. Great supporters of their local community energy groups. Um, that's all from us for now. Uh, there will be a, um, uh, a video made, as I mentioned earlier, and we will let you know uh, about uh, when that video will be available. I see a, a number of people uh, have uh, added some additional questions, which we won't go into at this point, but we'll let you know after the event and uh, provide the answers to those people and make the information available on our website as well. So once again, uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, Aaron and Lucinda. I'd also like to thank Tom, uh, who's been our tech person in the background, uh, Tom Bazelier. Uh, always very uh, great, uh, very good to have Tom on board to uh, assist us with our, our technical work with these webinars. And uh, we encourage you to get in touch with your local energy group, get in touch with the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub and get involved with uh, community energy, uh, get involved with um, uh, impacting climate change, reducing the carbon footprint of yourself and your neighbours uh, in your local community and your businesses. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our uh, Community Energy Roadshow, which we will be starting at the end of May in Bunyip, and then we'll be running uh, around to each of the, the community energy groups uh, over, the, over the, the June period. Um, so look out for the notifications when they come through our uh, newsletter and email system. Thank you all for attending tonight and uh, we'll just leave it there for now and look forward to seeing you at our next event. And once again, thank you, Lucinda, and thank you, Aaron.